All righty, here we go. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, good news, my dad's tooth is fixed. Hallelujah. It's been like six weeks uh, since his failed uh, root canal. So for six weeks, he's had a hole right down in his tooth, down to his, you know, wherever. Uh, so it, it was abscess and stuff, but they were able to fix it today. So hallelujah. Um, any news on your mom, um, Cindy? Tomorrow she has uh, the appointment with the doctor for the pancreas back. So to go over the results and stuff? Yeah, we'll see what they want to do with that. Good. We'll we be praying about that. Keep, keep me posted, if you would, please. And, uh, When is Mike's t test? It's next, I think it's on the, the 9th. It's sometime next week. All right, and then uh, Kathy, she got some answers anyway, so let's pray that some new glasses, let's pray that she can get some uh, help with that, and uh, pray for that if you would um, as well. Um, Betty, any answers for you? Oh, okay, yeah. You got the nicotine patch, right? Yeah. Well, let's keep praying for Betty uh, as well. Tomorrow night, by the way, we pray for all these things on Zoom. Of course, we mention a lot of them in church as well. Um, anyways, I just thought I'd give those a little update, update about my dad's tooth and then. Mike's appointment is on the 12th, I just checked. October 12th? Yeah, just a lot of people going through tests and biopsies and all kinds of stuff. Just a lot of stuff. Uh, well, today we're talking about Barnabas. I mean, there's not a whole lot of scripture. There is some scripture that we'll see tonight. Um, but what a wonderful person. Not, not one of your main Bible characters. Just an ordinary guy that God used in a marvelous, marvelous way. We're going to look at some of his character traits and hopefully those will rub off on us. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day. And, and Lord, uh, we do thank you for the rain. We do, we do need rain. Uh, some parts of the world and country would love to have the rain. And Lord, we do pray, Lord, that you'll just meet with us now tonight. Uh, it's been a long day for many, many people uh, just working, rushing here. And I pray that you'll just settle us, Lord. I, I pray that you'll just help us as we look at Barnabas. Uh, that he'll uh, help us, uh, Lord, to be a, a pattern for our own uh, lives. Thank you, Lord, for uh, my dad's tooth getting fixed. Uh, thank you that Kathy got at least some answers. I pray that you'll uh, help with that. Uh, Lord, and for Betty, uh, we pr continue to pray for her as they continue to test. And Lord, uh, keep a hedge about her, Lord. And for Jane, this appointment that she has, I pray that she'll get some good news and Brother Mike on the 12th, uh, Lord, it's been a long journey for him. I pray that you'll uh, help him with this, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 4, if you look at it with me. Um, there's handouts back there somewhere. Rick has them. If, or, or they, I don't know. Uh, yeah, there you go. If you need a handout, grab one. Um, let's look at Acts chapter 4 together, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believe were of one heart, one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Hey, you think the church wants your money now? I mean, good night. They sold all kinds of things. They sold lands. They sold property. They brought the money, they laid at the apostles' feet here, and distribution was made unto every man according to, as he had need. And Joseph, who Joseph by name, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. So his name was Joseph. And uh, they renamed him, the apostles renamed him 
Barnabas. I believe that was because of his character trait of being a, uh, a, a, a generous person, a good guy. And it says here, which is interpreted son of consolation. We're going to look at that. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. And there was a lot of people doing this. Now, remember Ananias and Sapphira? They saw the accolades Barnabas was getting, accolades these other people, pats on the back. They thought, ah, we got a piece of land over here. Let's do that. But they conspired. You remember what happened? They lied, said they gave it all. They didn't. They weren't required to give it all. Nowhere in the Bible that God say, God, does God say, go sell your house and go sell your properties and lay all the money at the church. He doesn't. So they just did it willingly. Um, and so that's just a side note. Whatever we do for the Lord, we should do it out of the goodness of our hearts. We should do it for the glory of God, not for the praise of man. We certainly shouldn't uh, pry, try to be deceptive about it. But the apostles gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Consolation means encouragement. Barnabas was an encourager. That's what the lesson's about today. He was a son of consolation, the son of uh, encouragement. And I believe they didn't call him that just out of the clear blue, right? They called him that because of the person that he was. They wouldn't call a negative, nasty guy the son of consolation, okay? So obviously he fit the description. Again, that's a good testimony uh, for him, and it's a good testimony for us that we would have a good name. The Bible says a good name. I think it's Proverbs. Oh, my goodness. 22, I, I don't know. Uh, a good name is rather to be chosen than what? than great riches. And so good name is very, very important. We'll look at three main traits and many sub uh, points under this. And um, first, he was a man with a generous spirit. He was generous. He had a piece of land. He sold it. He laid the money at the apostles' feet. And again, he wasn't required to do this. It's just something that he did because he had a generous heart. There's several sub points we're going to look at about generosity this evening. Generosity allows us to become like God our Father. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. You know one thing the devil does, he lies. What's one of the main lies that God, that the devil has spread about God? That God, all he wants is to take from you. He wants to take your fun, your entertainment, Right? He wants to take your freedom. He wants to take your money for sure. He wants to take all these things. So the devil has spewed this lie for centuries, and it's sadly it took hold pretty good. Because even to this day, people are like, all, all church wants is your money. And I get it, you know. Um, I understand that because of what happens, unfortunately. Um, but generosity allows us to become more like God, right? If we are to be restored as those who bear God's image, now we're image bearers, by the way, going all the way back to Genesis, we are image bearers for God, and that's what we're supposed to do. So if God is a giver and kind, right, and sharing, then that's what we uh, should do. Um, the generosity that flows from God, right, should flow from us. Why? Because we have God in us. Look at this fill in the blank here. You are most like God when you're giving, right? Now you could argue that point, I guess. Uh, you're more like God when you're, you know, fill in the blank. But a big part is giving because for God so loved the world that he gave. We could not be saved without God giving. And so God gives us. He gives us grace, right? He gives grace to the humble, right? He gives us so many things. So God is a giver. And so we want to be Christ-like. One of the greatest ways we can be Christ-like is what? Giving, and have a giving heart. Very, very important. Now, unfortunately, again, because of the devil, Paul talked about it so much in Romans 7, and our flesh dwells what? No good thing. So the devil, he appeals to our flesh. We see in Matthew 4, Jesus was hungry. He did not eat for 40 days, if you can imagine, right? He was hungry. The Bible point blank says he was. He was in a weakened condition. Who showed up? Devil. 
He said, make these stones into bread. Now, is that a sin? I don't see a verse on it. But he wanted Jesus to start following his flesh. When we follow the flesh, we're not going to follow the Father, right? right? Wow, I just made that. Look, write that down. Sign my name to it, would you? Over there, Aaron. Um, but yeah, when we're following the flesh, we're not going to follow. We're not following the Father. Uh, Galatians 5.16. It's in there. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Right? So we walk in the spirit, the flesh. It's tough. And it wants things, does it not? No, you're, be you're better than me, right? Um, for a long time, I wanted a Barry Sanders helmet, signed helmet. And then lo and behold, the church family, you wonderful, wonderful people. I felt so carnal up here in the house of God getting something so fleshly, you know. It's your fault. You fed my, you fed my flesh that day. You shouldn't have done it. No, I'm just kidding. But I wanted that, all right? And it's not a sinful thing, all right? It's better than wanting a Dallas Cowboys, something signed from the Cowboys. And I'm telling you what, that, that right there, Jerry Jones and that whole crowd down there, I would never be a fan. Of, now, that's flesh. <laughs> I'm picking on Joe. He loves the, did you know Joe, Joe loves the Dallas Cowboys? And you know Detroit plays the Cowboys pretty soon. So how about Detroit? I'm not even going to talk about Detroit. 45 points and loss. It's only the 10th time in history that's ever happened. Out of thousands of games, like 80 years, only my beloved Detroit Lions. We break the wrong kind of records, right, Kale? We break the wrong kind of records. Um, but the flesh, seriously, we can get following the flesh, right? And material things and all the things on and on and on and on, all right? I love these couple quotes here. I don't think I put them in your handout. Um, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. I like that. I never heard that before. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And so a giving person, there's going to be a lot of accolades at that funeral. I just went to one a couple days ago, Ryan's grandpa. And... Uh, I said to my wife, I'll confess something. I said to my wife on the way there, I wonder how close they were to their grandpa. Man, that got answered in a hurry, sitting there listening to him talk about their grandpa. And you know what? He was giving. But in Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge, when he dies, that was part of the whole story. He saw when he died, nobody cared. They were just fighting over his clothes and and fighting over his stuff. And what a, what a, what a good principle for us is uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody weeps over the stingy, nasty person, that's for sure. And so I said to Ryan, I said, man, what a, what a testimony, you know, to live our lives in such a way um, that we are mourned, you know, and that people think, wow, that, he was a real giving person, nice person, a kind person. And so I learned something even, even more this week God instilled in me um, that the real measure of our wealth is how much we'd be worth if we lost all our money. The measure of our real wealth is what would be, we be worth if we lost all of our money? Is that what gives you your life, your status, your testimony, all that? Um, it shouldn't, of course. And so he was a generous person. Generosity allows us to become like God the Father. Number two, generosity frees us from the deception of ultimate ownership. If I have in my mind who really owns what I have, I'm going to be more generous with it. Because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. I'm giving you a personal illustration. Please, these are just helpful this isn't to Pat Preacher on the back, okay? I bought a brand new pressure washer. I used it maybe one time to, for five minutes. And Rick said, Pastor, I want to pressure spray this whole church. I said, the whole church? He said, yeah, I want to do the whole church. 
And he did, by the way. I mean the whole church. Check the gutters and check everything. It's pressure sprayed. And I thought, boy, my pressure sprayer is brand new. And he's going to bring you here to the church and run it for, I mean, hours and hours and hours right in a row. And can I be honest with you, for a split second there, I thought, man, man, I just bought that thing. You know? That's my, that's my uh, brand new pressure spray. <laughs> and what does God do? You know? Whose pressure sprayer is that? Man, it's, it's God's. God will take care of it. I've tried to live that. And it's tough because by nature I'm a very, very selfish person. I really am. I never had to share anything my whole life. I mean, I was a boy with two sisters. Never had to sh They shared a bedroom and I didn't. They shared clothes, not me. They shared toys, not me. I didn't share anything my whole life. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of... But I married my direct opposite. Sometimes, Josie, what in the world are you doing? I could tell you stories just about yesterday, even. I'm moving a table in the rain, pouring down rain. Right? I use Nathan's truck. And again, what are you doing? What are you telling people this for? It's raining. And by the time I did the whole thing, I felt lower than dirt. I mean, really, God just got a hold of me driving that truck, and I thought, man, I'm a pastor, and I'm, I'm helping somebody here. So what if it's raining? You know what I'm saying? But we all get so selfish and rotten, and all of us do. Don't look at me like that now. You, you, you're all looking at me like, pastor, man, we need a new pastor. You're rotten. <laughs> but uh, I'm working on it, okay? I'm working on it. Give me another chance. But seriously, it's not my own. You know, I struggled with this as a youth pastor. Teens would come over the house. I mean, they broke everything. Broke my trampoline. I could, off the top of my head, broke my basketball hoop multiple times. Broke my, 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 uh, my trampoline. Uh, my nephew, Cowboy Bill, he's still a cowboy, a real one out in, out, well, now he's living in Texas. He trains horses for a living. He had this thing about wearing spurs. I mean, he's living in Michigan. I'm like, what are you doing wearing those spurs? But... And one, one time on a youth activity, he took his lasso. He always had his rope and his spurs. And one time he broke my, you know how I am about trees and stuff, broke my birch tree, right? Broke, broke it in half because he couldn't get the rope off of it. I was throwing fits, going into convulsions. But then he took his spurs, right, sat down on my couch, my leather couch, okay? This was a nice leather couch. It was one of those Nartuzis or something. I think my dad paid like five grand for it back 30 years ago. And what did he do? He put his spur right through my Nartuzzi brand new couch. I told you all that to tell you not to say, oh man, you're a great guy. No, I, in every situation I was irate. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. But you know what the Lord did over and over again? He's replaced so many things in my life. I don't care if it's cars, if it's houses, if it's furniture, if it's, I mean, wow. Over and over again, God spoils me and spoils me and spoils me. He really does. That generosity frees us from the deception, that's a key word, of ultimate ownership. The Bible says the multitude of them that believe were of one heart, one soul, and they looked at everything belonging to God. All right. Um, so the, they weren't their own. Every, the, everything comes from God. Um, being generous, giving, is more of a mad, matter of managing. Stewardship, you know the, the term stewardship, the very next blank. The term stewardship has to do with managing the assets that God has given to us. Right? God has given us our time. Right? We get spoiled with our time. It's like, okay, well, this is Wednesday Connect. Oh, my. You know? We're giving God an hour. All 24 are his. 
Do we, do we really believe that? All 24 are his, so I just give them an hour. And I, and I always mention this verse when Jesus said to the disciples, what, could you not watch with me for what? One hour, can't you watch with me just for an hour? What's, <laughs> and they were tired and everything, of course. Um, but remember, everything, our time, our talents, our treasures, right, belong to the Lord. And so we need to understand that. Um, my job as a pastor is not to turn you upside down by the ankles and shake every bit of money I can out of your pockets or every bit of time and talent I can out of your pockets, uh, out of your, you know, uh, just with the crack the whip, you know, get over here and do this. Or, no, you just try to help and you preach the word. You let God speak to people's hearts. And you know what, if everybody's obedient, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, if everybody's obedient, right, in, in having that mindset that ownership is God's, then you know what, the church will lack for nothing. It doesn't matter if it's a painted wall or a new air conditioner or whatever. Because people in the church have those talents, ability, treasures, and they do it. And what a beautiful thing when that happens, right? And I mentioned, when I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I said, what if nobody, played, what if Nathan said, no, I'm too busy to play the piano? You know, I, I don't, I don't want to play the piano all the time. I just want to sit in a service and just enjoy the service. And I get that. Sometimes we do need to take a little break, right? But sometimes in my life, what I've experienced many times, I, I want to say most, but I, I'd have to think it through. So I don't want to lie. But many, many times we, we take those breaks and guess what? We, we like not doing anything. And then before you know it, I'm not doing anything. I don't have time. Um, so realize God owns everything. And that's what Barnabas had the attitude. These other people that sold these things, brought it to God, they had the mindset, God owns everything. And so um, it's all about giving and it's about return. Now, that's not why we do it. But I mentioned earlier, you know what? God has given me new couches since then and new vehicles since then, and all these things. So realize this, God will return. Give, that's a promise, Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. And so, um, anyways, return. The next blank is return. Uh, that is the perspective we should have of the resources God has given us. What kind of return? are we bringing to God's kingdom, you know? And if everybody is obedient, if everybody has that mindset, wow, what great things can be accomplished. Here's another thing under generosity. It embraces that we are bound in a healthy responsibility to others. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I've already hit it. So, but this is another point. We have a responsibility to be generous to others. I just quoted that verse, Matthew, uh, Luke 6, 38. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. You know, everything God's given me, it never floated down from the sky. Not one time. Well, you know Malachi 3. God says, I'll rebuke the devourer. He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And that's all scripture. But have you ever seen showers of blessing like falling from the sky literally? No. God blesses me through you. God blesses you through me and others. Right? And so God blesses others through us. So let's realize the important responsibility we have. God speaks to your heart and says, help that person. Have you ever been there? Oh, I could give you testimonies about that one. I can't afford it right now. I don't have it right now myself. It'd be good if somebody would give me that, you know? Um, but we're bound. Okay, these people here, they had one heart, one mind. They had a mindset about community. 
right? Now, I'm not talking about living in a commune like they did in the 60s, all right? Everybody sold everything and just lived in a commune. That's not what God is talking about here. But they were just bound, right, in heart and mind. They were changed from the inside out. They didn't care about their own. They thought about other people. And so I don't know about you, that's a constant battle with me. And I'm the pastor. Last night I was complaining because I had to help somebody in the rain. You know? And so, um, the inside out. Paul, he learned this in his ministry. Let's look at the scripture here, Acts 20, 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. One of the reasons why we should labor is to support the weak. Now, now I'm not talking about the lazy bum. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't what? He shouldn't eat. And we've got to be careful about being judge and jury about that. Because we don't know the problem people have. I'm not trying to make an excuse for people not working, but sometimes people have a lot of issues. Mental, physical, emotional, a lot of issues. All right? So we need to be considerate. God never made us judge and jury. But the Bible does say if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And so, uh, anyway, so Paul said you labor so you can support the weak. That's one of the things that we do. Now, we can't take it all. Oh, my goodness, that's what the government's doing. I mean, you used to have to work till like, February to pay your taxes. And I don't know what it is now. You know what I mean, that one statistic? It's like May. You have to work till May, the average person, till May uh, before the money's yours just because of taxes and stuff. Um, but anyways, he said this. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And you don't really experience that, or you don't really believe that until you do it. And then, and then you feel good about that, you know, about helping that person. Now, we, we shouldn't do it to be seen of men. God, there's other verses about that. God says, if you do it to be seen of men, that's your reward right there. But if you do it in secret, God, what? He'll reward you. So do we want a pat on the back from fellow man, or do we want God to bless us? Wow, there's really not, uh, it's really not a hard choice right there. Here's the next one. Gen generosity must rise above the powers that work and, and a few things. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I'm already lollygagging. These things, fear. Our generosity must rise above fear, especially like times like right now. Man, I can't, you know, be giving and generous. And I'm not talking about tithing per se. I'm talking about, it's part of it. But I'm talking about just being generous. You know, they'll tell you right now in this type of an environment, uh, Salvation Army, um, St. Jude Children's Hospital, all these different charities are, are hurting. Because guess what? People are like, uh, and part of it is just because of fear. It's not because people don't have the money to give it anymore. But now they're saying, well, I better cut back. And, and, and I'm, t I'm not talking about being foolish, okay, with your, with your money. But fear is one of those things that will stop us from being generous. We say, man, I can't, I can't do that. I'm going to skip. You can read the rest of that on your own. Here's another one. Com com uh, consumerism and entitlement. We are living in a society that just consumerism rules and reigns. Even with Christians. We become consumers even as we're looking for churches. What does that church have to offer me? Just like if you were going into a grocery store. Well, which one is the best one, has the best produce, and has the best choices of meat? And you know what I'm saying? So sometimes we even carry over our search for a church, different things like that, into that consumer mindset. What does this church have for me? Now, church should have some stuff for you and your kids. Don't get me wrong. That's part of what we're doing tonight even, you know, and, and with the children and different things. So it's important. But it shouldn't be our main purpose. Well, how's their music? You know? What kind of this program do they have? That's consumerism. And it goes totally against what God wants to do. Right? Um, entitlement. Man. Allowing things we want to become things that we need. That's why companies spend millions of dollars on commercials. 
You don't need it, but you want it, right? Let's look at this next line. Generosity is an antidote to the limits of materialism. I love this statement. I don't know who said it. Generosity is to materialism what kryptonite is to Superman. You know? The more you give, the easier it is to give. The more you hoard, the harder it is to give. So it's like we have to learn to give. So I, I work on that all the time. Thank God I'm married to my wife. Otherwise, I'd be a terrible, terrible person as far as that goes. That's the truth. Um, deprived identity. Wow, this is huge. Identified with being in need rather than the ability to give. We categorize ourselves as those in need. Explain that to me. Well, you see somebody get something, and you say, in your mind, in your heart, I needed that. Why'd they get that? We expect everybody else to have what we have and no more. I've seen this. I've been in, working for churches now for 30-some years, 36 years. Man, I've seen this. I've seen it in my own personal life. You know, when you're a pastor, you're not expected to have anything nicer than anybody in the church. Because if you do, people, some people don't like that. I'm just being honest. Because people don't like that. If the preacher drives a nice car, lives in a nice house. But a lot of times, those same people don't know where a preacher used to live and what he used to drive for 20 years. You know what I'm saying? And so what I'm saying is we get to the mindset... I'm deprived. I'll never forget this. I don't even know why I'm going down this road. God must know somebody needs it. Because <laughs> I don't know all my heart. I don't know if you need it, but God knows. One time I was on staff at the same church for, for 16 years. Um, and I remember one time uh, some guys got together and said, the preacher needs a new car. And so somebody found one. It was used. It was only a couple years old, but it was used. It wasn't like some Lincoln Continental. And so we had a meeting. I was in that meeting. And there was one particular guy, very adamant, that said, preacher's car that he's driving right now is nicer than the one I'm driving. He said that with his own lips. He said he don't need it. He had this deprived mentality that you know what I drive a drunker so everybody else should drive with drunker and if you don't you're you're following your flesh or if you buy new clothes some people brag about the fact that they wear the same clothes they wore since 1972 well that's your your business you know well, I haven't had a new suit since 1969 well number one I can tell and number two <laughs> God bless you I mean, seriously. What did they get that for? I, I don't need it. They don't need it. Okay, and I, believe me, teaching this, I don't have nothing stuck in my craw. I'm blessed here. Okay, I'm sure there's probably little things, but I don't know of anything. I'm not unloading here. I'm just saying, don't do that. Don't have that mindset. Um, they don't, I don't need it. I don't have it, so they don't need it. So it's called a deprived identity. All right, uh, let's look at this next thing. We see others as haves, and we as the have not. And we cut ourselves off from generosity because we see ourselves as defined by our needs. Let me just tell you, I'm not trying to use psychology on you. The end of that meeting, everybody said, yes, let's buy a preacher of the car. The one guy said, no, he don't need it. He was adamant about it. He was, he was agitated. Let me tell you something. Nothing ever good had happened in that guy's life. I'm serious. I mean, bad stuff happened to that guy. Oh, can I tell you with a shot, without a shadow of a doubt that's why it happened? I'm just saying that mindset, I'm convinced that that mindset is part of it. And uh, but, but, but preacher did get his car, okay? But anyways, uh, um, the widow and the mites, she could have said, 
man, let, let, let so-and-so give it. I, I, look, I don't have nothing to give. She gave it. And Jesus said, what? Wow. She gave more than everybody. So let God take note. Let God take care of it. All right? Um, ultimately, generosity, this isn't in your notes, but generosity is a way of life. It's a pattern. Okay? Um, it's something that we must learn to do that becomes a part of us. And like I said earlier, it, it's easier to do as you go along. Number two, he was known as a man who could be trusted. I don't have time, I don't have time to go over all those point, these points right here, but three separate times, Barnabas was trusted by the early church. Three distinct separate times. He had trust. So what a good lesson for us. Number one, be like Barnabas. He was very generous. It even, it, even his name meant, meant generous. Number two, he was trusted. Three distinct times the church called upon him to do something. Okay? So we should be trusted. Again, a good name is rather to be chosen than what? Great riches. We should be dependable. Right? Uh, you've probably heard those sayings. There's no ability like availability. There's no ability like dependability, all those kind of things. Uh, who's the most trusted, dependable, faithful person of all? God is faithful. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Right? And then... 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And then there's some examples there you can look at. Silvanus, Moses, Onesimus, right? Uh, faithful people. Unfaithful people cannot be depended upon. They cannot be trusted. You know, you know the old statement, my word is my bond. Now, let's be honest, we've all been there where, where we forget or we don't do it, okay? Um, I'm just talking about, again, as a habit. Habits become our testimony, and uh, we shouldn't have that testimony. Barnabas was very, very faithful. Confidence in an unfaithful man is like a what? Broken tooth or a foot out of joint. And then lastly, Barnabas was a man who saw the good in other people. Two distinct examples here. The Apostle Paul got saved. You know the first person to give him what's called the right hand of fellowship? Barnabas. Now we know before that he was helped by another guy. But I'm talking about when he, once he came into the church, who, who was one of the first key people to, to accept him? It was Barnabas. Another example, John Mark. Have you ever heard about John Mark? He was a young guy. Went on the missionary journey. What did he do? For whatever reason, he quit. He went back home. Well, here comes another missionary journey. Paul was adamant. He said, I'm not taking him. I'm not taking John Mark. So he took Silas. Barnabas said, what's the big deal? Give him a chance. He's a young kid, whatever. So the contention was so great between Paul and Barnabas that they split it right? didn't mean they hated each other forever, but they, they split. Paul took Silas, and Barnabas took John Mark. Right? And so he had a mindset where he saw the good in people. So again, a great testimony for us. Um, we have two people, the Apostle Paul. He was given the right hand of fellowship by Barnabas. John Mark, he was given the right hand of fellowship. When other people said, no, let's not trust him, Barnabas said, yeah. Let's give him a chance. And so, you know what? We need to see the good in people. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, I struggle with that. Um, we need to see good in people. Um, we need to allow people to make mistakes. Right? Now, I'm not talking about killing, <laughs> murdering people or, or some kind of terrible, terrible. But I'm talking about things within reason, you know, uh, things that they don't have to be disciplined by the church for, all right, or, or put in jail for. Uh, we need to, what, uh, help people. Uh, just man falls down seven times and gets up. What do we do with them when they get up? Say, well, 
get over there. You're no good to me anymore. You know, we shouldn't do that. Although we do it, we're all guilty of it in some way. But hopefully this lesson will help us to realize, hey, you know what, that person needs a chance. Um, it could be a, a, a child that needs a chance, right? One of our own children. Uh, it could be our spouse. It could be um, a, a brother or sister in Christ. Um, and I think that's it. Is that the last blank? I think it is, all right? Um, but see the good uh, in people. Who, who did that? Jesus. Peter denied Christ. Cursed, I mention it all the time. Peter in his mind was done. But Jesus saw good in Peter. Jesus saw good in David. I mean, even after he committed adultery, even after he killed somebody, Jesus still saw good in him. God did. So if God can see good in people after they do bad things, guess what? I can see good in people, or try to, at least. Let's stop. Father, thank you, Lord, for this lesson. Thank you for Barnabas. Just so many things, so much meat 